Now for the hard part. That's the focus of tonight's angle. All right, all weekend long, I was still kind of processing, like many of you, Trump's historic comeback. The bogus lawsuits, the frivolous indictments, the relentless defamation, Kamala's $1.2 billion war chest. I mean, not even two assassination attempts could break him. Even his most strident critics are recognizing the opportunity he has to reshape Washington. He swept every battleground state. He increased his margins in New York and California. Trump is riding into Washington, whether anyone, I mean, just the, the, the political reality is that he is politically as dominant and strong as he's ever been. Holy Toledo. All right. Trump gained ground in 49 states and the District of Columbia. But of course, the question is, how much support can President Trump get on Capitol Hill? Because, look, he outperformed pretty much every Republican who ran this go-around. Trump's agenda, which he specifically campaigned on, should be the Republican agenda. And his focus was not just the border, not just the economy, but our trade policy, our defense policy, too. So given that the GOP likely controls both houses of Congress, it'll be a narrow majority in the House, it's realistic that Trump voters expect his policies to be swiftly moved through Congress. But at a minimum, and I mean a bare minimum, President Trump should be able to rely on Republicans that he helped to regain the majority in the Senate. They wouldn't have beaten Sherrod Brown without Trump. They wouldn't have beaten Casey without Trump. Or maybe not even John Tester without Trump. And under these circumstances, especially Again, with that small House majority, the position of the Senate majority leader is even more critical. Now, just so you all understand this, and there's no reason you would have to know the intricacies of, of, of Hill inner workings here, but as a practical matter, no bill can get to the floor of the Senate, and no amendments can be put on that bill and voted on in the Senate without the support of the majority leader. It just does not happen. That's why Mitch McConnell is so powerful. Now, right now, there are three candidates for the position. Two of them, John Thune from South Dakota and John Cornyn from Texas, are both seen as disciples of Mitch McConnell. And both have a history of being fairly critical of President Trump, who they'd prefer not wade into the internal Senate deliberations at all. My preference would be, and I think it's probably in his best interest, to stay out of that. These uh, Senate uh, secret ballot elections are probably best left to senators, and, and he's got to work with all of us when it's all said and done. Now, I understand why the Senate wants to preserve its independence. I get it. But at the same time, let's be real. They all owe their majority status to him, Donald Trump. And think about it. When McConnell worked with the MAGA Republicans and the MAGA agenda, like on court nominations, uh, the USMCA, the tax bill, they got stuff done. It was great. But when they're at cross purposes, as you saw with that Langford Schumer immigration bill, that fiasco, or the absurd infrastructure bill, the results are just horrible. The people have spoken. Trump has won Texas, where Cornyn's from, South Dakota, where Thune's from, three times in a row. So it is logical for voters in those states to believe their lawmakers will work with him, not against him, to advance the agenda, and certainly not throw monkey wrenches at it. Now, we have an incredible, and this really is a once-in-a-generation chance, Charlie Kirk was right when he said that last week, to make a difference in America and to enact policies that the voters have been wanting for years. We have no time to waste, which is why over the weekend, Trump urged whoever gets the leadership role to agree to recess appointments, because sometimes the votes can take two years or more on key um, cabinet secretaries and other positions, which is what the Senate did last go around. And Trump added, we cannot let that happen again. So John Cornyn is trying to get around the recess appointments by promising to keep senators in session even over the holidays to get all Trump's people through. And those are nice words, and maybe that, that'll happen. But Trump does not have the luxury of time. 
And even if his agenda is stymied by the usual swampish uniparty maneuvers, the Republicans are going to get wiped out in 2026 and maybe in 2028 if they try to slow the agenda down. And what, <laughs> after everything that he's been through, everything the country's been through, what a travesty it would be if Trump's historic victory is undermined, not so much by Democrats in resistance, but by his own party. How do you think voters would react to that next time they hear in a call or an email from the RNC? And while we're at it, why are these Senate leadership votes secret anyway? Look, if you disagree with President Trump, that's your right. Disagree with them on whatever it is, deportations or in uh, tariffs on China. Why not, though, stand and be heard? Others have done that in the past. Let's not play hide the ball anymore. That's not what we're into. We never have been. No more killing essential legislation in committee. President Trump deserves a fair hearing and a vote on the policies that he campaigned on relentlessly. And if senators or congressmen, they take issue with what he's saying, then vote against those measures. And then let the voters decide the fate of those legislators or senators when they're next up for re-election. Might be worth remembering Pat Toomey or Jeff Flake or Liz Cheney or Adam Kinziger. See how it worked it all out for them. We don't elect senators to be part of a club. They're supposed to be representing the interests of their states. And the voters in their states have been very clear. They support Trump. The other candidate for the Senate Majority Leader is Florida's Rick Scott, who's been a stalwart supporter of President Trump since his first term. Scott has also said this. How do we get Trump's agenda done? How do we get his nominees done? How do we codify his executive orders? That's what's, that's, what's on, that's what's up for this leadership race right now. We have a mandate for change. So number one is who is going to represent um, all the Republican voters? Bingo. Of course, he's right on that. But Punchbowl News is reporting that some senators who don't support Scott are annoyed and they feel bullied by the growing online chatter. Now, I was... <laughs> Talking to my kids about this, we're driving around in the car. I said, imagine boys being a U.S. senator and feeling put upon by voters mobilizing online. I mean, isn't that politics in the modern era? That is the town square. Now, this all gets more interesting because Elon Musk, who's helping President-elect Trump, is supporting Rick Scott. At this hour, Scott's online army is mobilizing and flooding Capitol Hill with calls and emails which, according to Axios, has left some senators livid and frustrated, with aides warning that it could even cost Scott votes. Again, the source speaking to Axios is anonymous. Typical swamp move. But if they're so livid, if they're so frustrated, they need to come on the angle and tell us why, that the American people shouldn't have anything to say about this online or anywhere else. Again, no one is disputing the separation of powers concerns. But the Senate is not supposed to be run like the Bel Air Country Club, where a membership committee can blackball someone in secret. And I was thinking about this also. Notice how the Democrats always seem to stay united and jam through, ram through their priorities. So I say let's beat them at their own game. Let's, let's unite behind the America First agenda that the voters have made abundantly clear they want implemented as soon as humanly possible. And that's the angle. Trump promised to hire better people this time around, and he's off to a hot start. Ladies and gentlemen, Americans' heartthrob Stephen Miller is getting a promotion. This time he'll be deputy chief of staff for policy. That means he'll have a lot of authority over the mission. Former New York Congressman Lee Zeldin has been tapped to lead the EPA. New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik will be U.N. ambassador. Florida Congressman Mike Waltz has been selected to be Trump's national security advisor. He's a former Green Beret who's come on this show demanding answers about Butler. Kamala's no longer border czar. Former ICE director Tom Homan has been put in charge of mass deportations. And Tom's not messing around. I got a message to the millions of illegal aliens that Joe Biden's released in our country in violation of federal law. You better start packing now.
if sanctuary cities don't want to help, then get the hell out of the way because we're coming. Is there a way to carry out mass deportation without separating families? Of course there is. Families can be deported together. Trump also declaring who will not be joining his administration, Nikki Haley and Mike Pompeo. Remember, during the 2016 transition, the RNC was in charge. Trump didn't know Washington, and the FBI was setting booby traps. This time, he knows the terrain, has executive orders already drafted, faces little to no resistance, and is ready to hit the ground running. His new chief of staff says this, the window to revolutionize the government is more like two years rather than four. And while Trump takes over the government, Democrats are trying to figure out what to do with Kamala. First, they floated the idea of putting her on the Supreme Court. They tried to force wise Latina Sonia Sotomayor to step down because they say she's 70 and has diabetes. But the wise Latina caught wind of the coup and her people told the journal she has no plans to retire. Sources tell Primetime Brett Kavanaugh was ecstatic when he heard he didn't have to work with Kamala and had a beer. So since that's off the table, Democrats want to finish Biden off with another coup. Joe Biden has been a phenomenal president. He's lived up to so many of the promises he's made. There's one promise left that he could fulfill, being a transitional figure. He could resign the presidency in the next 30 days, make Kamala Harris the president of the United States. Whoa. He would absolve her wow. <laughs> from being able to, ha to, from having to oversee the January 6th transition, right, of, of, her, of her own defeat. <laughs> and it would make it easier for the next woman who runs for president to not have to worry about all the historical, you know, first. weight of being the first. We've just gotten a look inside the mind of a modern-day Democrat. Who cares what the voters want? Promote an unqualified woman who didn't earn it so her feelings don't get hurt. The white guy who earned it, eh, who cares what he thinks? He's old. The Bidens still aren't even over the last coup. Harris and Biden were seen together today for the first time since the landslide at Arlington Cemetery. Dr. Jill's giving Kamala the cold shoulder. You think it's a little tense? I do. But Pelosi's telling the Bidens to get over it. It's his fault they lost. Had the president gotten out sooner, there may have been other candidates in the race. Should there have been an open primary, though? Well, see, we thought that there would be. A, you know, there, it was the anticipation was that that if there if the president were to step aside, that there would be an open primary. Nancy's saying they shouldn't have run Joe or Kamala, even though at the time she said Joe was FDR and Kamala had more magic than Barack. Biden world's gone from bickering behind closed doors to fist fighting on the front lawn. Nancy Pelosi, everybody talks about how the Speaker of Merta, you know, she's so strategic, she can count, and yes, she did all of that when she was the Speaker in Congress, but my question is, where is your calculator now? Because Democrats are about to damn lose the dang on House, and for her to sit on this podcast, we'll play the sound about how, you know, oh, it's up to the, you know, I don't I don't deal in presidential politics, but she helped orchestrate, I'm going to well, say she it. Did this cycle. She, no, she, she played she, in presidential uh, oh, politics this yes. cycle, <laughs> and she helped orchestrate the very public demise of the president. That's right. And thank God for Joe Biden that he came out and yes, endorse his VP, because these people wanted an open primary. And, where? and for where? It's like a prison yard fight, and Jim Clyburn's trying to break it up. As we take an assessment of all of this, uh, we all just chill out for a while, uh, get um, uh, in touch with each other, uh, don't worry about blaming anybody. I think we all just take the stock of who and what we are and not get caught up uh, in the uh, pointing fingers and assigning blame. Clyburn's trying to play peacemaker all of a sudden. He's the one who created this stupid ticket in the first place. He backed Biden in South Carolina and in exchange forced him to pick a black woman as his running mate. They both went down in flames and he's telling everybody, guys, stop pointing fingers. Nobody's listening to James. He's toast. The party wants blood. Biden loyalists are complaining behind the scenes that this is the second time Obama pushed Joe out, first in 16 and then in 24. And both times Joe would have won, they say. Axelrod's glasses almost shattered. Come out to the daylight and say what you have to say, put your name under it, and then let's have a discussion about it. But don't be such a sniveling little coward that you put an un, un, uh, unnamed quote out there saying what is absolutely <laughs> Look at the guy. <laughs> the Clinton syndicate also itching for a fight. They feel like they were ripped off into buying a jalopy. 
we didn't even get a chance to kick the tires. We just said, you're buying the car. And you have no choice. And, of course, we bought the car. <laughs> Biden endorsing Kamala just 30 minutes after the coup. That was the kiss of death. And after three years of covering up Biden, the party was forced to cover up for Kamala and say she was a Ferrari when she wasn't. The second they drove off the lot, she crashed. I think if this campaign is reducible to one moment, we're in a 65 percent wrong track country. The country wants something different. And she's asked, is so often the case in a friendly audience on The View, how would you be different than Biden? It's the one question that you exist to answer. All right. That is yeah. it. That's the money question. That's the one you want. That's the one that everybody wants to know the answer to. And you freeze. You literally freeze and yeah. say, well, I can't think of anything. When we go back and history unearths this, it's going to be right there on The View. Did you ever think a View interview would doom a Democrat? I didn't. Democrats around the country are lined up outside the bathroom now to wash their hands of this. George Clooney says he's taking a step back from politics, so don't make him a scapegoat. And Democrat insiders are leaking the Rolling Stone that it wasn't their idea for Harris to campaign with Liz Cheney. They say they begged Harris to stop. Quote, people don't want to be in a coalition with the devil. They were saying, hey, maybe focus more on energizing your base than Liz Cheney. The Harris crew told him to get lost. No, thanks. Oh, and Bernie's loose. He's running to the Sunday shows saying, I told you so. How exactly do you think Democrats have abandoned the working class, Senator? Look, the working people of this country are extremely angry. If you're an average working person out there, do you really think that the Democratic Party is going to the mats, taking on powerful special interest and fighting for you? I think the overwhelming answer is no. Nancy Pelosi's telling Burn Dog to just shut up. Well, I, I just completely disagree. And in fact, might notice that Kamala Harris ran ahead of Bernie Sanders in Vermont. So what does that tell you? I mean, well, it tells you that the fact is, is that what we do, what our purpose is in the Democratic Party is for America's working families. But so since you voters... pursue it... What, 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 go ask Bernie Sanders. He, Bernie Sanders has not won. Let me, with all due respect, and I have a great deal of respect for him, for what he stands for, but I don't respect him saying that the Democratic Party has abandoned the working class families. So the Democrats doing an autopsy on Tuesday's wipeout, and the results are in. America thinks they're crazy, preachy, incompetent, and abandoned the working class in exchange for illegals, transgenders, and felons. The New York Times says some Democrats are finally waking up and realizing that woke is broke and they're just a bunch of brats. That's what I hate about the left. <laughs> you're brats. You're brats and you're snobs and people don't like that. This wasn't just an election. This was an intervention. The left shut out of every branch of government and their coalitions being gobbled up by a hungry billionaire who came back from the dead. Their leadership's all in their 80s, on their last legs, politically. And the one person who was supposed to know what he was doing staged a coup without a backup plan. Obama's biographer says Barry's been extremely concerned and nervous about how history will remember him. That has certainly taken a big hit with Trump once again triumphing. Democrats all thought it was tone deaf and clueless for them to preach as they did, but now he's as, as relevant as Bill Clinton. Barack never saw Biden's snap Kamala endorsement coming. He got outmaneuvered by Sleepy Joe. It was his last bit of revenge as he pulled the knife out of his back. The Democratic Party has destroyed itself, trying to destroy Trump. And the more they resist, the worse it gets. Everything they're resisting, the majority of the country backs. And all the tactics that they used are so dirty and unconstitutional that they've turned Trump into a folk hero for surviving and winning. Since they can't stop us, we're not invited to Thanksgiving. How do we move forward when we know there are people in, you have people in their families who voted for him. They work with people who voted for him. They live next to people who, who voted for him. What, what do you, how do we, how should we deal with those neighbors, co-workers, family members. Do you recommend, just from a psychological standpoint, being around them? We got the holidays coming up. 
it's completely fine to not be around those people and to tell them why, you know, to say, I have a problem with the way that you voted because it went against my very livelihood and I'm not going to be around you this holiday. I need to take some space for me. Mm, yep, people are taking some space in the Waters household. I'll have you know that I was not invited to my mother's house for Thanksgiving. Apparently, there wasn't enough room. <laughs> she said it was a scheduling situation and then at the last second invited me to come over on Black Friday. There's no crying here. <laughs> Happy Monday, everyone. Today is Veterans Day, huh? Yeah. It's the day Tim Waltz recalls the terrifying combat he witnessed while watching Save it, Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. It was a good one. I just f***ed <laughs> it up. But because it's a federal holiday, a lot of stuff is closed, including banks, the post office, and Bill Clinton's pants. <laughs> there was a big Veterans Day parade in New York City today. It was a mix of 20,000 marchers, 25 floats, and a few dozen Kenyans from last week's marathon. <laughs> they always win. On Wednesday, President Biden will host Donald Trump at uh, the White House for a traditional post-election meeting. I don't want to tell Trump what to do, but if I were him, bring a few bottles of Febreze. <laughs> While walking on the beach Sunday, President Biden stumbled multiple times. I guess that's what happens when you try to scatter your own remains. <laughs> Poor taste. Leonardo DiCaprio turns 50 today, huh? Yeah. To celebrate, he's taking his girlfriend to get her learner's permit. <laughs> a Yale psychiatry fellow told MSNBC it's okay to cancel Thanksgiving plans with relatives who voted for Trump. Also endorsing the effort, Trump voters. <laughs> yeah. Nick Bosa, is that his name, of the, of the 49ers, was fined by the NFL for pointing to his MAGA hat during a broadcast. The fine will go toward promoting LGBTQ sports, also known as soccer. <laughs> Trump has named former ICE director Tom Homan as his border czar. And to prove that he's not messing around, Homan asked Melania for her paperwork. <laughs> All right. That was fun. So it's postmortems galore, watching the media point fingers at everyone but themselves. But really, this is just a mass misdirection in an effort to save what's left of their credibility. And like true psychopaths, the media lacks the empathy to realize that we know they're lying. And we knew it's been them all along. So what you're seeing now is a ruse. See, the media is like the creep who gets rid of the spouse, but then volunteers to lead the search party. <laughs> Except in this case, it was a disappearance of truth. And now they're volunteering to search for it, telling us where to look and actually expecting us to include them, even though they're metaphorically covered in blood and Brian Stelter's actually covered in tomato sauce. <laughs> but they're terrified, not just of Trump, but of losing their influence. So now they're starting to sound like us. Interesting message for Democrats. Maureen Dowd's piece for The New York Times entitled Democrats and the Case of Mistaken Identity Politics. Some Democrats are finally waking up and realizing that woke is broke. Democratic insiders thought people would vote for Kamala Harris, even if they didn't like her, to get rid of Trump. But more people ended up voting for Trump, even though Many didn't like him because they liked the Democratic Party less. Mm, now, remember, that's the same duo who blamed Kamala's loss on racist black and Hispanic men. So maybe they finally ran out of people to scapegoat, and the only targets left are in the mirror, except they keep breaking those. Listen to Jen Psaki dishing out advice. Look, I happen to believe that Donald Trump is a major threat to our democracy. Too many people either didn't buy it and didn't show up or were willing to price in the risks because other issues were more important to them. 
And the answer to that failure isn't to say fascism doesn't matter, it does, or to say everyone who didn't vote for Harris is to blame for not hearing or understanding the threat. It's for candidates to rethink how they prioritize what they talk about moving forward. It's to rethink how they engage moving forward. Do that Joe Rogan podcast, by the way. Ugh, a little late. <laughs> Jen, I'd say quit while you're ahead, but you're so far behind, you need to circle back to wipe your own butt. <laughs> Dems all over are sounding the alarm on what Trump will do. Geraldo suggests Trump could demand a third term. Thankfully, he made this prediction while wearing a shirt. <laughs> Don't worry, Geraldo. If Trump takes a third term, you'll be too old to know what a president is. Many predict Trump will break the law or violate the Constitution. Sorry, he's not going to put the view in an internment camp. <laughs> Although they could use the exercise. <laughs> but they assume Republicans would go along with lawbreaking, like using the levers of government to target political opponents. In other words, they assume Republicans are just like them, but they're not. And it shows that the media and the Dems don't know any actual Republicans. The closest they've come is smelling one of Liz Cheney's farts in the green room. <laughs> For Republicans, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, that comes first. If Trump tries to unconstitutionally take away anyone's rights, we'll be first in line to stop it. We always are. After all, isn't Trump's main promise that he's going to actually enforce the damn law, as in have a border, remove criminal gangs, restore order to the cities? Show me this great respect for the law that the Dems have. Was it during the 2020 Summer of Love when Kamala helped bail out the rioters? And Gwen Waltz kept her windows open because she loves the smell of burning Firestone radials in the morning. What about a president that's incapacitated? Isn't a president who keeps falling down supposed to step down? This guy was responsible for more spills than a waitress with Tourette's. And yet, and yet no 25th Amendment or forced resignation. A move, by the way, that prevented the first black woman from becoming president. And yet they accuse you of bigotry because you didn't vote for Harris. Now, never mind that Trump increased his numbers with blacks, Hispanics, and yes, even suburban white women. Turns out Mr. Hitler himself, Mr. Racist, Mr. Misogynist is more about inclusion than the Democrats themselves. That must be a real kick in the nuts to this woman. And these accusations of racism are coming from people who said nothing when the Democratic Party itself rejected Kamala. Kamala's 2020 primary for president made the Hindenburg look like SpaceX. But were the racist ones? No, fact is Kamala's about as popular with both parties as crabs are at a nudist colony. I mean, she had to appear with Liz Cheney so she wouldn't be the least popular person on stage. <laughs> But it's so much easier just to call us Nazis. It's certainly easier than reporting on a candidate who can't answer a question without cackling like a hyena who's twirling on the wrong end of an electric toothbrush. <laughs> but it was them who didn't want her, or they could have had her. I mean, she could have been president, used the 25th Amendment. That would have been lawful, actually. So why didn't they do that? Was it racism? Was it misogyny? Because, you know, they can still do it. Joe Biden has been a phenomenal president. He's lived up to so many of the promises he's made. There's one promise left that he could fulfill, being a transitional figure. He could resign the presidency in the next 30 days, make Kamala Harris the president of the United States. Whoa. See, bad crazy people can be right. If they truly believe Kamala was denied the presidency because of racism and sexism, Biden can resign right now and she could be president for two and a half months. So what are they waiting for? They can make history or herstory. <laughs> so why haven't they done it? Who are the Nazis now? Let's welcome tonight. This Hawaiian has Democrats crying. Trump transition team co-chair Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> the stuff he writes keeps Newsom up at night. Founder of Public News on X and Substack, Michael Schellenberger. <laughs> His one-liners upset liberal whiners, comedian Dave Landau. She's expected and needs disinfectant. New York Times bestselling author of Fox News contributor Cat Tim. Really? 
Dulce, I've watched you change, and I don't know, I don't think you've changed that much. I actually think the world has changed. Very much. But you, I think you noticed what I'm, what I'm talking about, that it wasn't necessarily left versus right. It was about this larger environment of dishonesty. Yes. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.